Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Art of Life Explorations with Angela Hardy. Today, we're speaking to Nikki Robertson. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I uh, have a business called Cloud9, and I'm a personal transformation specialist. I teach people how to love themselves. I teach people how to have a good life, how to feel good inside themselves, how to let go of all those sabotage programs that keep them back, that keep them held into this self-hatred or lack of acceptance or not okayness. And I have a wonderful time doing that. And apropos of that, I like to know how to hack life. I just think that knowing how to do life well, knowing all the tricks of how to get along, how to, how to feel good in yourself, are so wonderful, so useful, so interesting. And so I interview these really, really interesting people who also know how to hack life and have these different ways of doing it and different aspects of interesting things that they do with their life and their businesses. And today I want to introduce you to Nikki Robertson. Nikki Robertson, well, actually, I think I'm gonna let Nikki introduce herself because she is a fascinating woman with a wonderful, interesting story. And she's got so much to tell us about reinventing your health, reinventing your body, and helping you just learn how to use food and wellness to become that experience of yourself that you really want to feel. So this is Nikki. Wait, let me hit the right button here. This is Nikki. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you so much for that intro. It was really amazing. <laughs> I'm a spinner of words. <laughs> I, I get that, yes. <laughs> So Nikki, I was reading your website and you had this fascinating personal story about your whole um, your whole battle with weight and how you started to understand nutrition and how you started to figure out how to actually work with that. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because I sure. think it's just a great story. Sure. Thank you. So, yes, I wrote that as a kind of a journal originally um, years and years ago, and I popped it on my website because, well, I thought if people could relate, then, um, then I could help them better. And I got flooded with emails from all sorts of people, men and women, saying that's also my story. And I realized that most of us have many shared experiences of life, whether it's you know emotional experiences or experiences with our physical physicality, but we don't talk about it and we don't share it and we feel alone. And that's a big problem because if you don't feel like you're the only one in the room with this issue, uh, you feel like you can deal with it. So being able mm -hmm. to talk to somebody who's been there and um, figure out how to get through is such a powerful form of healing. So over the mm -hmm. years, I refined the story. Um, it's eventually, it's going to be in a book next year, um, along with a whole lot of other stuff. But um, essentially what happened was from a very young age, I had poor body image. And we inherit that from our parents, we inherit that from our peer groups, for whatever reason, nobody's born with a bucket of confidence. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make a conscious effort of working at it, um, it gets eroded. So life has mm -hmm. a way of knocking you down. And unless you've got the tools to pull yourself back up, it can cause problems. So I went through life thinking as a child that I was overweight. I wasn't overweight as a child. I was quite normal. I look back at pictures. But eventually it became an eating disorder. Um, I used to starve myself. I tried all sorts of crash diets. And eventually I broke down. I destroyed my metabolism as a result. And eventually I did put on weight. I put on a lot of weight. And I became insulin resistant. Uh, it interfered with hormone production. And I was in a mess eventually. After trying every diet on the planet, I was very active. I was a dancer. I was a figure skater. I did a lot of stage work. Uh, so I used to literally starve to lose weight and I could, I was very good at starving and then I would put it back on. And so many people have been through this, but eventually diets don't work because your body gets wise, because it's tired of the abuse, because your metabolism shuts down, because for all sorts and kinds of reasons that have got nothing to do with dieting and calories, um, things start to shut down. So uh, at that time I was in media, I had an advertising agency. It was really successful. And I decided that the entire medical industry was lying to me and I was on a mission to find out what the real answer was. So I sat down in front of a doctor who I still talk to these days and I said to him, I want to get all these blood tests done. And just by the way, I need that magic pill that you're not telling me about. And he said to me, <laughs> there is no magic pill. I promise you, you can have anything. Just tell me, I'll write you a script, but I can promise you now. Until you change your mind, your body's not going to change. And that was the last piece of information I really wanted. I wanted a quick fix, like everybody wants a quick fix. Yeah. And so what I did was 
I went and studied nutrition. I thought, well, if he's not going to tell me and nobody else is, I'm going to figure it out for myself. So I went back and studied. I started off with dietetics and I gave that up after a year and I went into clinical nutrition for, for various reasons. And um, I learned that the dieting, the hypotheses and the protocols around dieting are fundamentally wrong. They go against uh, what our body needs on so many levels that um, calories are a complete myth. Uh, there's so many principles to the diet and industry that uh, is designed to sell products and designed to keep you fat. Because if you mm. lose weight, you won't be buying the books anymore, will you? Anyway, mm. so that's another story for another day. So yeah. within three months, when I'd figured this out, I lost 30 kilos of fat for the very first time in my life healthily. Yeah. Um, I went down like four sizes, but for the first time it was out doing, without doing damage. And um, people started asking, what did you do? Uh, I remember sitting in a gym one day and I was talking to somebody about this and suddenly there were 10 people sitting around me and they're all listening and asking oh. questions. I thought, well, this is fun. This is really cool. <laughs> and this is how I started what I do now is like, I can help these people. And yeah, it was just, it was a, it was a thing that just had to happen. I was on this boat and it was taking me down this road and I had these lessons for a reason and I'm so grateful for that. Okay, well, I can't help myself. What did you do? <laughs> I ate a lot of food. <laughs> I stopped dieting, so I started eating. I started eating real food, like protein and fat and carbs and actual food that you would find. Like, I can't say it's a paleo protocol. There's no name for this. This is just real food. Um, I didn't eat processed food. I stopped eating sugar. I made a point of going to sleep off, you know, early enough. Um, mm. I did exercise, but not a huge amount, about three and a half mm. hours a week. Uh, I stopped beating myself up. That was the thing. I started nurturing myself with food and the body responds really quickly. Look, I was strict about it. There was no way I was going to break from what I was doing. I was very, very focused on what I did and I did not deviate but I certainly wasn't dieting and I was not hungry and I felt amazing and there is no secret this is just what human beings are designed to eat as a species at some point in your life you might need some more protein at other times in your life you may need some more healthy fats but the trick is to stay away from anything that's been processed or contains a lot of sugar and chemicals and that is really the fundamentals of, of getting this right it sounds simple it's a little bit more complicated than that but that really is all it takes well i mean we've heard this message a million times even i who's to be perfectly honest don't think i've ever actually ever dieted in any way shape or form in my life um but i am very aware of this this concept and i've obviously used it in my own life where i wouldn't have been through the experience of never having had to diet in my life of eating whole, natural, proper food, mm -hmm. staying away from processed stuff and staying away from sugars as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but there's the other aspect which I'm obviously really interested in because it ties in with what I do and what I'm really fascinated by is the mind is a really, really important aspect in this whole thing of, of weight, of weight as protection, which is a very, very commonly held idea that the weight serves some sort of purpose. And also, just in terms of the happier I am, the easier it is for me to make a good decision. The less tired I am, the easier it is for me to make a good decision. The, the more energy I have, the easier it is for me to make a good decision. The better I feel emotionally, the more supported I feel, the easier it is for me to make a good decision. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and I, I think you, you're absolutely right, because the mind is, is everything. It's not just a part of, it is absolutely the center of getting this right, because uh, once you've made a choice, once you've made a decision to no longer abuse your body with junk, that's mm -hmm. all it takes. And it is, it's a, it's a form of self-respect, very mm -hmm. much so. And if you, on some level, have low self-esteem or you don't have self-respect, to make that decision to stop putting rubbish down your in your mouth is not going to happen. It is a, it's a very, very clear decision that we make. I see this all the time. I've got uh, clients in my practice who I don't think they're going to make it. And then they, they, most people surprise me like crazy. That's just like they do it. And I always say to them, what happens? How did yeah. you suddenly get this right? And they say, I just made a decision. I just couldn't do that to myself anymore. And that is, that is really it. You've got to get to that point where 
your mind isn't going, well, what about my maintenance plan? What about my cheat days? What if I can't, oh my goodness, have a pizza over again? Once you've let that go, yes, of course you can. But when it stops being the center of, oh, I need this stuff because it makes me feel better about myself, then you're going to succeed. And that is, it's, that's why it's, it's quite tricky to, to do this for many, many people. It's not like, here's a diet and you're going to lose a kilo a week. It's, like, mm, it's not that simple. It's what goes on in your head that's going to enable, yes, you can lose a kilo a week. It's up to your, it's up to what's going on in your brain. And if you feel like you're deserving of self-nurturing. And yes, I mean, when you eat good food, it's an expression of love. Because you are nurturing your body. It's our first experience of connection with another human being is, is, is feeding. Um, it's not just this random grab something, take away, fill the gap, and feel terrible the rest of the day. But, oh, it's okay. We'll just take a Rennie's. It's like that is not being very, <laughs> you know, um, nurturing. That's really quite damaging. But people live like this because yeah. for one little Moment in time, while they're eating that chocolate cake, they feel good. And it might be the only window they have in the day where they feel good. So what if we change that and you felt good all the time because you're constantly yeah. doing good things for yourself? So it's a big mental component. Yeah. I mean, look, I work all the time with changing people's minds about themselves. This is what I do. And I see, I mean, obviously I work with people sometimes who struggle with weight it's not my main line, but it is part of the work that I do when we're talking about self-love. There's a lot of things that people believe that keep them stuck out of self-love. There's a lot of self-judgment. There's a lot of self-talk. There's a lot of thinking that they have to beat themselves up in order to do well. I've always said, especially about weight or food, you can't hurt yourself into feeling better about yourself. Mm. Mm. You can't punish yourself into eating healthily because when I punish myself, it hurts. And what do I do when it hurts? I eat junk. Yeah. So the, it, there's got to be this mind shift. How do you in your practice work with a mind shift or do you outsource that to people like me who do that kind of work? It depends on the, on the client. So mm -hmm. for most of the time I can work – my background is also in NLP and in psychoneuroimmunology. Oh, right, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, but there are definitely people where we need to, I need somebody else on the team. I definitely mm -hmm. believe that getting someone through a lifetime of self-abuse is a team effort. And yeah. very often I pull in other practitioners who are more skilled in specific areas to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I can't do everything, especially when we're seeing, um, lots of trauma, lots of abuse early on in life. And those memories are really ingrained into the physical body. Sometimes we need a very specific therapy or a very specific therapist to deal oh. with that. If we're needing breath work, I, I refer out to someone who really specializes in getting people to understand breathing, for example. Mm -hmm. So I love to work in a team with other practitioners. Just really depends on the person. Nice. So tell me about what you consider to be the biggest myth in this whole get well with food industry. I'm always curious as to what people are like, oh, that, I wish people wouldn't believe that kind of thing. You know, tell me about yours. Okay. Well, oh my goodness. I don't even know where to start. I've In this book that I've written, I've got 10 myths yeah. and I could write 20, but probably the biggest one is, is calories. So calories drive me crazy because okay. calories are, I mean, you, before we knew what a calorie was, no one was overweight. Let's just think about that for a minute. Yeah. You know, the way that calories are worked out on a packaged food is there's a 30% error margin at, at worst, at most, really? you know, um, this, and people really take this to heart. If I eat less, uh, eat less and exercise more, I'm going to lose weight. I don't know anybody who that really worked for in the long term sustainably. Yes, everything works initially when you become conscious of what you eat. Then you're not eating um, macaroni cheese takeout every night. You're eating more uh. greens and more proteins. Of course, you're going to see a difference. These are less calorie-dense foods anyway, so you're going to 
you're going to be okay. But eventually it's going to get to a point where your body stops burning fat for energy. It starts storing it again because you're under eating. Even trying to figure out how much a person burns during the day. They say that the average adult burns about 2,000 calories a day. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. You probably okay. burn 2,000 calories while you're sleeping. Your brain uses up about 80% of that energy. Um, most people are really and truly, if you really took them to a lab, hooked them up to machines that measured their output um, and their heart rate and their lean muscle mass are really burning in the region of about three and a half thousand calories a day. So if you go tell an adult that they must go and eat 1600 calories a day, what's going to happen is their brain's going to send a message to the thyroid to say, stop making your metabolism work. And it's going to oh. slow down the rate at which everything gets done. So from your concentration and focus, you're not going to sleep right. It affects every system. And when you're not sleeping well and you can't focus, what do we go for? We go for caffeine. We go for sugar because we need to up our game. We need to think and focus. So it, yeah. we're throwing back the calories again. Not only the calories, but we're, we're disrupting the hormones. So the thing that determines whether or not we burn fat or store fat is our hormones. And what determines our hormonal health is the information we're putting into our bodies via our mouths and our brains. But really, I mean, if you eat a lot of sugar, you're going to increase your insulin levels. And when you do that, you're going to switch on every kind of mechanism that tells your body to store fat no matter what. So after many, many years of eating lots of sugar, now you go on this diet and you eat salads and you can't lose weight, it's because the signaling hasn't been restored yet. You haven't given your body the tools to start knowing that the fat burning can happen without you going into starvation. It's got nothing to do with the calorie. This is really something that sells diets, it sells products, it sells quick weight loss shakes because it's low calorie. And it's also, it's such a trap. Um, and it's got nothing to do with the way nature intended. No, 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 no tree with an apple on it comes with like, these are the amount of calories sitting in this apple. It's like, this is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense, but we, we buy into it because that's what we've been told and we don't question. And I think my message for people is question everything. If it's not working, mm -hmm. find out why. Question me. I love it when people ask me questions and we can get deeply into the hows and what's. There's no one size fits all for anybody. What worked for you last year may not work for you next year. It doesn't mean there's, a, there's something wrong with the diet. It just means we have to understand your biochemistry and your physiology at this point in time to figure out what works for you. And always, always question what's going on. Okay, so now this is really interesting. So this is why in your practice, I come in, you do a blood test. Okay, no. You come in no, and we spend no. an hour talking. So I want to really understand well, sure, you first. You need to know yeah. who I am and what I'm doing and what I'm craving sure. and why I'm reaching for things and what my philosophy is. And, yeah. okay, and I want to know your, your health history, what you've suffered from, what your, what your family is, you know, did you have okay. diabetes in your family? And then based on this very um, intensive functional medicine um, evaluation, then we pick blood tests. We don't pick everything because... You know, we can see yeah. quite early on if if certain things uh, need to be tested. For example, um, your insulin glucose uh, levels, your a, a lipogram so that's going on with 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 uh, uh, your your fats and your lipids. Definitely things like vitamin D. Definitely inflammatory markers like homocysteine. I want to know if your detoxification cycles are working. Most definitely a thyroid, if your hair is falling out or if your eyebrows are thinning or if your skin is drying out. So there's, there's lots of telltale signs that something is not quite right. So then, then I send you away for bloods, only if necessary. And with all that information, then we can start designing a strategy, not a diet. It's a strategy that includes working on behavior, planning, preparation, how you think about yourself and how you put yourself out into the world, as well as your eating. And then if necessary, I refer on to other practitioners, to doctors, if there's, if there's a major issue. Okay. Mm. That's very interesting. I've always, I've always believed that for my own, the way that I choose to, to do food, mm. I've always believed that the more good, valuable, healthy food I put into my system, the less I'm going to be craving rubbish. Right. Yes. 
So if I've just had some wonderful, very healthy, very satisfying meal, I'm not going to be wanting to eat cake. Yeah. Because I actually don't have space for cake and I don't have a list for cake and I'm not like, I'm not really into cake. Mm. So, so I've always had this philosophy when people say to me, oh, but I, you know, I crave this and I crave this and I crave this. And I keep saying to them, well, put good stuff in. Don't worry about what you crave because the more mm. good stuff you're shoving in there, the less craving is going to become an issue for you. Would you say that's totally. a philosophy that you work with? Completely agree. A craving is a, a signal that something's wrong and it's often a case of you're not eating enough good food. And if you are, you won't crave exactly what you've said. It's absolutely true. It's a sign that something's out of whack. Okay. Mm. Well, that sounds reasonable. Mm. Okay. So let's say I come now and I, we've had this big discussion and I've told you something like, uh, I'm going into menopause. I swear I'm going into menopause. There's hot flushes every day. This is true actually. And <laughs> there's hot flushes and, um, uh, my period has stopped or is faltering or doing its little thing. I often hear people say, oh, that's menopause weight. That's menopause weight. Tell me about that. I'm really interested in that because I'm like, oh, is there going to be now menopause weight if I'm going into menopause? Is I'm going to have to like now have a menopause belly and have to go argy-bargy with a menopause belly every five minutes. Tell me about no. that. Not necessarily. And I did a really interesting interview with Dr. Cindy Bruder a while ago on, on the transitions of life and how mm -hmm. in the Western world women fight these transitions. I mean, it's a natural right. part of life. Look, let's be honest. Nature, if it had its way, we wouldn't live past menopause. We probably wouldn't even make it to menopause. We'd probably die of a virus or a bacteria. You know, the human being, we're not designed That's to live as long true, as we yeah. You know, yeah. so that said, if you look at women in, in India, in, in the Far East, in China, they embrace these changes in life and they take care of themselves and nurture themselves around these transitions. It's nothing to fight or try combat or medicate against. I think that's a really important thing to remember. And for many women hitting this age or perimenopause, menopause, they're highly stressed as well. They're not looking after themselves as well. So, you know, if you've got symptoms like hot flashes and you feel like you're putting on weight, there are lots of natural ways to deal with that and just alleviate the discomfort. But to start thinking about your body as um, it's, an, it's a miracle that you go through these different phases. And it's something to be, I think, honored and almost like acknowledged rather than bumping up against it. So one of the biggest causes of, of hot flashes, aside from the hormonal shifts, is anxiety and stress, not sleeping enough, not um, creating enough. Uh, endorphin when you exercise. So, so it's a sign to start really paying attention to the quality of your life if you're getting hormonal symptoms. It's not, not a sign to go off to the doctor and get estrodot because you want to fight it unless you're really suffering and you can't like move because you're perspiring. Um, so yes, there's a place and a time for, for these interventions, but not just like, oh my goodness, I've got to delay menopause. You can't delay menopause. You've got to almost come to terms with the fact that life changes. And I see it time and again, when women accept the fact that we're going through menopause and I'm going to now really pay attention to my health, they don't put on weights. They don't have the hot flashes. Everything goes away. We can use some botanicals and some Ayurvedic herbs and all sorts of things to just alleviate those symptoms if necessary. But really, it's a again, it's a mind game. And it's an acceptance on some level that this is the way life is. And we can, we can either push against the wave, still going to come crashing mm. down, or we can surf the wave and you can actually have some fun with that. Well, I mean, funny stories. I, I didn't realize that menopause was even that close to me, to be honest. I'm only turning 50 this year, so it's not exactly like I'm ancient. But, says the 50-year-old, <laughs> anybody 20 out there, please don't laugh. <laughs> but I must say that I was going along fine, and then suddenly I started having these hot flushes. Sheesh. And it started, they were, you know, just a little bit like, oh, okay, a little hot, nothing serious, it's all good. And then, boom, massive six, seven, eight times a night waking up. My husband rigged up this little, this super me me mechanized system for me, fan on the, uh, switch on the one side, fan on the other, they had the fan run for exactly two minutes. It was amazing, like I'd wake up, throw off the duvet, switch the fan on two minutes, the fan would turn itself off, and then afterwards I'd cool down the button. And it was hectic. 
-hmm. And my mother said to me, and get yourself on hormone replacement, do it now. I said, oh, okay, why? <laughs> She's like, no, this is bad for you. And I had to have a laugh because I was thinking, okay, now either she's completely ignorant because menopause is not bad for you, right? Or there's something else going on with the statement. So I said to her, what do you mean it's bad for me? She's like, it's just bad for you, okay? I was like, no, no, what do you mean it's bad for you? She says, she says to me, the mood, the temperature, the irritability, the frustration, the lack of sleep, the wanting to kill your husband, it's all going to be very bad for you if this goes on. So I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. But then okay. what happened that was very interesting to me is I did take a supplement. I took a black, black what's it called, black cohosh? Black cohosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and either that or just the natural cycle, which I actually think it might have been just the natural cycle, obviously peaked, caused all this massive amount of discomfort. It was hectic. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of came down again, and then I was absolutely fine for quite a few weeks. And now I've got a few flushes coming back again. So I'm wondering if there's not a cycle that continues to go on of hormones that causes the flushes to rise and then go down again. I mean, I've, obviously, I don't know that much about. So, about yeah, they are cyclical, um, like menstruation is cyclical as well. Mm -hmm. If you're in perimenopause, you can have symptoms of menopause and then it can disappear for weeks on end and then come back when you least expect it. But it is, yes, the moods. You know, I think it's like PMS. If you know that three days before you menstruate, you're going to be in a wicked mood, you can almost go, okay, so that's what it is, and you move on and mm -hmm. leave it. It's being conscious mm -hmm. of what's mm -hmm. going on in your body. Um, with, I mean, hormones are directly tied into your state of mind and your 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 moods. Um, but it's being kind to yourself. And listen, even if it means having to wear a red T-shirt and say, family, I'm in one of those spaces, <laughs> you know, wear a wrist. Add the blood river going on here. <laughs> put a yellow bow around the dog when they bite us so other people don't touch your dog <laughs> why don't we just wear a yellow bow when we're feeling ratty yellow bow chokers and, yes. go into public and, let know, <laughs> and then people know and then it's also you know it, it, it takes the seriousness out of the situation mm -hmm. so it is real it is physiological but it's also there's a big attitude situation going on here if we if we embrace it and we go this is what's happening to me you'll find mm. your symptoms will feel far less severe and just it just is what yeah. it is yeah. look yeah. i mean i absolutely agree with you mind state is everything the way you think the way you approach I mean, the way you process an experience is very important i was just processing hot flush fan cold flush because of course once you get finished being hot you get cold right so it just yeah. doesn't end. But um, <laughs> but I must admit that I couldn't live like that every single day. It was mm -hmm. really, really tough. And I did read a lot of the whole, you know, I went to Dr. Google, and Dr. Google was very clear, stress, alcohol, sugar, bad eating. I was like, no, 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 no. Oh, why am I flushing so hard? Interesting. Mm. But who knows? I mean, that was one month of my first time I've ever had it, it might never even happen again. So we wait and see. Keep the smile on the dial. Wear the yellow yeah. yes. <laughs> At the end of every winter, I get an influx of messages from clients going, I think I'm going into menopause. And it's because they have either haven't turned off the heating in the house <laughs> or the electric blankets are still on the bed. I couldn't believe this. It happens almost every springtime. Like, have you turned off the heating? Oh, no, we forgot to do that. It's like, hmm, let's start with that. Maybe the flashes will go. All right. Oh, dear, this is hysterical. All right, so um, bog standard advice. Um, somebody comes to you, they're looking to not necessarily lose weight. Uh, you were speaking to me earlier before we went on about the fact that some of your clients are sports people and they're looking to improve performance and that kind of stuff. Tell me about working with that kind of um, individual. Okay. So I love working with sports people because they don't, they just, they do everything they're told. They are so determined yes, to beat compliant. their time. They are so systematic that you, you can give them a ridiculously strict eating plan with tons of food in it and they will stick to it to the gram and they will have their results and it's super satisfying. And if the rest of us could employ that mindset of this is my direction and this is what I need to achieve, damn, would be, would, they, they, they are, it's super to work with them. 
Um, so also what I find with, with uh, if we had to compare, for example, athletes to the average person is that professional athletes understand that in order to succeed, in order to perform, in order to thrive, we need downtime. We need sleep and we mm. need time when we're not training and time when we're not pushing, that the body needs recuperation. So mm. I don't, you know, we expect this output from our bodies all the time. We expect it to think clearly, go to meetings, fetch the kids, cook the dinner, look amazing, you know, get it all done and not feel like you're exhausted by two o'clock in the afternoon. But we're not giving ourselves the time to rest. And, you know, I think if we can take anything away from to the professional athlete side of, of, of this kind of work is we've really got to put more importance on a quality of sleep. There's no other way of saying that. And it's, it's a really difficult topic to tackle because there's so many reasons why people um, aren't sleeping well anymore. And we could say it's because of devices and light intensity. Um, I just think we don't put enough value on rest. And it's a big, big problem. And I think, you know, aside from food, if you're not sleeping, nothing's going to work. Your circadian rhythms, which is your internal clock system, is directly wired to your endocrine system, which tells your body what hormones to make. Um, it is directly linked to your DNA expression. It is so important to send those messages to those systems to clean out the rubbish and to, sh uh, to sort out the packaging, for, for want of a different word, in your brain, to sort out what needs to be remembered, what doesn't need to be remembered, um, and to literally purge of the toxins that, that come through our systems every day. We do this through sleep. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the old saying is, I'll sleep when I'm dead, couldn't be more true. You know, you, <laughs> you'll be dead soon enough. You're going to die sooner if you don't sleep, <laughs> you know. And this is so if even more important than, than the eating is if you're not getting um, seven to eight hours of sleep a night and out of that seven to eight hours, you need about, I'd say, an hour and a half to two hours of deep sleep, um, which you can track on a device, you're going to be more susceptible to disease, you're going to age quicker, and you're never going to be a healthy body fat. And that's just the way it is. You know, there's no getting away from that. Uh, yeah. It is very dangerous not to sleep well. I mean, you only have to look at kids who don't get enough sleep. They can't study and they are abysmal to be around. They are ratty and snappy and rude. Mm. It's lack of sleep. And this is really, it's a big deal. Mm. Yeah, I was reading Johan Hari's book, Lost Connections. It's all about depression and um, how, uh, what kind of aspects influence depression and how come people become depressed. It's a really interesting subject for me because I work with people around yeah. their depression quite often. And he was saying that a good night's sleep is as effective as an antidepressant, except yeah. it doesn't have side effects. Yeah, yeah. So it is, that's a really yeah. interesting idea for somebody who study depression and all of the side effects of antidepressants and all the kind of crap that goes with that. And he's saying sleep well. Sleep well is the most important thing. I, but, I mean, I know agree. a lot of people who maintain they cannot sleep. They cannot sleep more than five hours a night or more than three or four hours a night. And I'm just like, whoa, I would be mm -hmm. completely comatose if I couldn't sleep more than I sleep a good eight to 10 hours a night and I value my sleep deeply. So yeah. what would you do to help your clients get better sleep? Would they get better sleep just by nature of their diet or is it by concentrating on actually a sleep regime? What is it that you're looking to encourage them? How do you help them to yeah. do it? It's, it's such a far reaching subject. So one of the tools that I use is, is not journaling, but I use a, like a worksheet to write down what has been accomplished in the day, what still needs to be done tomorrow so we don't ruminate. Ah, take your mind you know, off things. Be done. Take your Put mind it down. Things. You don't have to think about it. Useful. Exactly. So it's, it's one thing having a notebook there and waking up every hour to write in the notebook, but that's a bit like counterintuitive. You don't want to wake up. <laughs> You've got to get everything out before you go to bed. Yeah. So get it. that's one way of, of just – purging what could possibly keep you awake. Um, mm. The other thing is finding um, the time that actually works for you. So for many people, they go, oh, I can't get to bed before 10 o'clock. I don't know about that, eh? I think mm -hmm. we should experiment now and again with getting to bed with sunset and just see how your brain functions as, you know, when you start experimenting with going to bed earlier. Yes, you might wake up earlier. So waking up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning is your cortisol turning on too early. 
And cortisol is your internal alarm clock. It is the, the security guard that tells you to go guard the cave. That's why cortisol is there. It's like, get up and make sure the cave is safe. But if we're getting to turn on the cortisol too soon, it means you're, you're not balancing your stress. You're not getting to bed early enough. There's so many reasons why that happens. So when we're looking at finding a way of getting somebody to go to bed early or sleep better, it's an experimentation process. We're going to experiment with writing down everything. We're going to experiment with going to bed at different times. We're going to experiment with um, not just the exposure to light, but the content. So if you're watching the, the U.S. election before bed, there's no way you're going to sleep well. You know, well. If you're watching comedy before bed, there's a much better chance. If you're reading a book that is lighthearted and amusing, there's a very good chance you're going to sleep better. So it's the mm -hmm. it's the the subject matter that you're exposing yourself to before bed as well. Not going to bed, like having a fight with somebody, your spouse or your, your business partner, and then trying to go to sleep. It's not going to happen. I made a concerted effort not to check email, any, not even open email after 5 p.m. Because, you know, what are you going to do about it at 10 o'clock at night? Nothing. Rather deal with that stuff in the morning. Um, but otherwise, you're just going to wake up and start planning revenge stories in your head. So, you know, uh, so no. So there's got to be some rules in place. It's like what you're prepared to expose your brain to and what you're not ex prepared to expose your brain to. So even, that's, even that's a good start. healthy things can stop yeah. your sleep. I mean, I, I know I'm a badminton player. We play badminton at night. If I've played league, um, especially the first few league games, matches that we play, if I play a tournament in the evening, we play at night, we finish at 11 o'clock or whatever, there's no way. Do you know what no. I mean? That You really no. have to decompress because even that healthy adrenal function that comes to play when you're, when you're competing, when you're in a sport, it's perfectly healthy. It's great for you, but you're a very alert. Yes. And you don't sleep well when you're very alert. We shouldn't exercise at night. We really should keep that in the morning because it wakes up your brain, it pushes oxygen and nutrients into your brain. It tells your brain that it's time to go run. You know, whether you're running away from a predator or you're going to go hunt something, when you're moving, oh. it's alert state. And we need to wind that down from about sunset. So going for a gentle walk is one thing. Playing an exciting game like badminton or if you, like you're competing, uh, that's not conducive to sleep. So it's, you know, understanding. It's got to happen though, Nikki. I'm sorry. It's got to happen. I'm sorry. Got to sleep on those other <laughs> nights. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. And, you know, for some people, for many people, exercise after work is their shut off. So it's, that's what defines, especially now yeah. when you're working from home, it defines this is the end of the work day True. and it's the it's beginning of downtime. Yeah. So we've kind of got away that up, but going and doing like a resistance training session is not going to hype you to the extent that a badminton tennis game or going for a run is going to do. And right. because it's, you know, when you're playing a game, it's social, it's the antithesis of sleep. But we've got a way up, you know, maybe it's needed occasionally because it's fun. And that's a critical ingredient to your health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, talk to me about, this is a subject that I find absolutely fascinating. I watched this BBC um, program once and they were talking about mood foods. <clears throat> and actually, I, I read a few books about it as well, about mood foods and how you can use food in terms of the mood itself, in terms of how a specific food changes your mood, actually cues your body to produce a bunch of um, chemicals, how things like cashew nuts are so important for the release of uh, serotonin because of the tryptophan, all that kind of stuff. Talk to me about mood foods. Mm. So food is, as we say, information. It literally signals uh, biochemical responses in your brain and your body. So it's not just a case of put something in your down your throat and or out it's going to go eventually. It's, there's all sorts of information that's being imparted to every cell in your body every time you put anything in your mouth, even the water you're drinking, which is quite a scary concept to to think mm. about, considering the amount of toxins and chemicals that's in our in our food. Have I disappeared? No, you still all right. Um, so, yes, I mean, we all know that chocolate could put you in a good mood. There's, there's a reason why people need their chocolates uh, because it, it creates serotonin. So uh, cocoa is well known to, to um, induce uh, uh, neurotransmitters that make us feel happier. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter that is the antithesis of anxiety. 
funnily enough, mm -hmm. it's not the happy hormone. That's dopamine. Dopamine is happiness and drive mm -hmm. and fun. Um, so and yes. Serotonin is the relaxation, the anti-anxiety um, neurotransmitter. And so it's no wonder we go and look for um, high-sugar high foods because that's what it does. Considering we live in a world that is so like, saturated with anxiety and deadlines and pressure that it does for even just 30 seconds, you feel like everything's going to be okay in the world. So even healthy foods, and there's many, like you said, um, cashew nuts are one of them, um, any kind of protein-rich food is going to induce a state of, um, of feeling better. You've just got to know which ones to pick. So yeah, dairy products are a great example. Um, and I don't, you know, not everybody is comfortable with eating dairy. Not everybody should be eating dairy. But dairy products contain enzymes and amino acids. That also, a tryptophan is also one of them that make you feel relaxed. Um, turkey mm -hmm. isn't a good example. That's why people feel apparently feel sleepy after eating turkey. I think that's because of the alcohol they have with the turkey. It's really what's making them sleep. <laughs> It's not the turkey, but it is relaxing. So, you know, the problem the is... The constrictive you, feeling after Christmas. Yes, yes. It's like, oh, I was going to lie down. Um, yeah. It's like, but you don't know this because we combine foods all together. So you've got mm. highly inflammatory foods with highly nutritious foods. If you're going out to, say, a restaurant, you don't know what's working, what isn't working. Mm. You can have the best quality salmon, but if that's dunked in trans fats and deep fried, well, there goes your nutrition benefits and also the brain benefits from those foods. So, you know, it, it comes down to quality um, and, and looking, you know, f f further than just the obvious, you know, I need a sugar fix because I'm feeling miserable. I need a caffeine fix because I'm feeling tired. But everything you eat is going to affect your neurochemistry. Everything you eat is going to affect your hormones. And it talks to every cell in the body. So it's like, it's a bit of a daunting situation. Okay, give me your top mood food for having a hectic day. Mm. I would definitely say really good quality, 80% cacao. Well, that's your, okay. your, your cocoa bean. Yeah, for sure. Um, and chocolate's and you don't not a stimulant? Not for, no, no. It's not, it's, okay. you know what, to say no is crazy because it's so individual. For some people, they it's really stimulating. For other people, it's really okay. relaxing. Okay. Cacao without the sugar can be very, very um, chilling. It can be a really good chill food. Uh, mm, so if pure cacao, cacao butter is very relaxing. So it relaxes the system. Green but tea is inedible. also one of those. Yeah. Almost inedible, surely. It must be very bitter. Well, it's, it's okay. I mean, you can mix up cacao butter with honey. You can put it into a drink. Okay. Uh, there's lots of ways to, to do cacao. Um, but also with a little bit of sugar and some some very good quality chocolates, it, it's never okay. going to be a problem. But again, it, it depends on the individual. Um, teas are always, for me, really good way of, of feeling better and uh, winding down. Um, you know, the herbal teas, even black tea, even especially like iced green tea with a bit of um, good quality honey is a really, I find it extremely calming. Uh now and that's think, interesting because I thought that green tea had more caffeine in even than black tea. So is this not something one should stay not, away from at night? Not at all, no. And I don't know if caffeine is a big problem either. I think caffeine in coffee, the levels of caffeine in coffee are much higher than green tea. Um, so no, it's it's a highly individual. I could have I could have a double espresso. Um, I used to be able to have a double espresso and go to bed quite easily. Yeah, I can't do that anymore. Before. Um, but green tea, never a problem. I can give green tea to my daughter and she'll pass out. She'll go to sleep, sleep well. So no, I don't know. I'm not sure about that, to be frank. I think, you know, these, these ideas of where the caffeine is and how it reacts to the body is, is something that is not really completely understood. Uh, there's a lot of well, health have, benefits to the tea as well. You know, I have to mm. say that caffeine has got to be a very individual thing because I have very little caffeine in my diet. In fact, probably not really any. Mm. And when I have coffee, especially if it's a strong coffee, if I even have more than a few sips of coffee, I can, the whole of the inside of my body feels like it jangles. Yeah. yeah. And if I were to have coffee or even half a cup of coffee anytime after three o'clock in the afternoon, I, would yeah. it, so I wouldn't sleep that night. So I guess I'm sensitive to caffeine then because yeah. I have no caffeine in my diet. A little bit is going to go a long way. <laughs> but yeah, then, so we, as you said, yeah. my husband also can have a double espresso, no problem. Auntie goes, 
Yes. So we have receptors in our brain that um, the caffeine binds to. And Definitely. for some people, they metabolize it, re metabolize it really quickly. And for other people, mm. it sits around for 6 to 12 hours. It's so individual to say you shouldn't mm. or should. Um, no, no, it's, it's again, it's something you've got to play with and experiment with. You know, yeah, I think the whole subject of nutrition and how food affects you, I'm talking about not, not junk food, but how compounds like caffeine, like amino acids, like um, your anti-inflammatory fats affect diff people differently. Is you can never say, you know, here's a miracle uh, cure, you should eat that. It's, it's a case of experimentation, for sure. Yeah. I think that, I mean, ultimately the message is you have to learn to listen to your body. Mm. And it's not easy to listen because we have such a variety of food. Mm. It's not easy to know what is it that's doing this thing to me? What is it that's making my stomach curved right now? Because last time I ate this thing, I didn't have a sore stomach. And last time I ate that thing, I didn't have a sore stomach. And what is it that's causing this to happen? And why am I feeling so tired right now? I ate the same thing for breakfast I've eaten for breakfast for whatever, six months. Mm. So it's it's not always easy to listen. So I think it is really useful to have somebody like you who actually knows more about what goes into these things, what comes out of these things, to help somebody to listen. Properly, to I think we all need right. that. Yeah, we need we need to unpack it as well. I can't figure out for myself very often what's what I'm doing wrong. I need to talk it out with somebody else who can say right. try that. So we need to sort of like put it out there and try to think objectively because it's. When it's happening to you, it's yeah. very difficult to unpack. We all need somebody in our lives who we can work it out with. Even if even if we know lots of stuff, we still don't really objectively get it when it's happening to us. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, I need to talk it out as well. But just on the back on the subject that just came to mind of, of mood food is medicinal mushrooms. So your chaga, lion's mane, those um, – more sort of medicinal mushrooms that you can get um, when you combine them with, with with drinks, so you put them into soups. Those are incredible um, for for focus and concentration and mood enhancement. You can like really feel the difference, and they're becoming a lot more mainstream. They've been mainstream in the Far East for centuries. Also up in um, the Nordic countries, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, it's been a common tool that you know these these populations have been using these medicinal mushrooms in food in um, formulas and medicinal formulas for centuries and I mean these are highly functional populations that have got you know very low disease rates that have got very low incidence of cancer with people who just function really well so you've got to ask yourself maybe there's something in in these these molds and these mushrooms that you know we, we it's a secret to to getting life right Mm -hmm. I was, uh, did you see that show, um, I can't remember what it's called at the moment, it was that whole thing about uh, veganism and sport. Yes, Game Changers. Game Changers. Very interesting. I, like the moment I watched that show, I was like, whoa, because I would like to perform that much better when I play badminton. You know, it's really hard out there on the singles court. <laughs> it's going to be, <gasps> can't breathe. Okay. I watched it the other day and he, he's running, I think, this coming weekend, maybe, he's running this 100K up and down the mountain in the Drakensberg, and he went vegan based on that show to see what would happen in his body to see if he had more energy. What is your opinion on that? Okay. So firstly, don't confuse entertainment and science. That show was created by people who've got a lot of money to be made out of selling vegan products. So every um, doctor interviewed there wrote a book on veganism, and it's a self-promotion tool. Uh, James Cameron owns a company that makes pea protein. The more people that buy pea protein, the more money he's going to make. So they all have a vested interest in the outcome of the message. That's already beyond the scientific method. That's not science. That is now marketing. So already the message is diminished. The credibility of the message is diminished. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to look at the athletes they interviewed who are almost all of them no longer vegan. Um, You've got to look at what their lifestyles were before they were put on a vegan plan. Those young uh, football players were all eating KFC before they were put on a, on a vegan plan. So that's always going to be a better solution. Yeah, they were literally li living off takeout and your body can't perform. So even if, 
And they've got so much testosterone. The average age of those guys was between 19 and 23. They are so full of testosterone that if they never ate protein for five years, they'd still have enough muscle mass purely based on hormone. So to say that that's a standard for everybody else, again, that's not scientific. That's not, that's very, very like a keyhole example of, of something that purportedly worked. All of them, I think all of them, maybe one or two aren't, but every single one of them have gone back onto an omnivorous diet. Um, I don't know about the guy who was that, that really big strong man. What they don't tell you is the lengths they have to go to to replace those amino acids synthetically. That's what they There's left out of that show. There's a lot of protein required to replace Protein is the single most, in my opinion, important nutrient you can have. So um, you cannot get a complete spectrum of amino acids from plants. They just don't exist in plants. And if you had to combine plants to get those amino acids, you would be eating all day long like a horse or like a gorilla. So they go, well, a gorilla's got muscle. And a gorilla doesn't have the digestive system that a human being's got. Uh, they have different hormone levels. They have different gut en enzymes. They spend 16 hours a day chewing leaves just to break out the, the, the nutrition out of those leaves. We don't sit around all day chewing leaves to try and get the nutrition out of them. Um, horses as well. They have a different biology and biochemistry to humans. So to compare gorillas and horses and humans, like you may as well go comparing Martians and, and, and humans. It's different species. We have different requirements. We have different brains. We have different everything so the credibility of the interviews all the way through that show were like anybody who understands nutrition would go ah this is not a good argument anyone who understands basic science even high school science would go this is not if i had to present this argument in an exam i'd fail because it's not proving the case it's not even disproving the case it's just a marketing ploy hey. The bit where they got the hard on for forty percent more often at night and it was stronger that but impressed me. That was really impressive. But look at their age. They <laughs> right. were hard on anyway at that age. They're designed to procreate at that age, you know? I'd like to see them replicate that with a seventy year old. Then I'll pay attention. Yeah. And I, I just, I, there were so many holes in that. It was like, it was actually, eventually I felt embarrassed for the, for whoever was making it because it's going to fall apart down the line. Um, yeah, you're going to see the holes fall through the, the bottom fall out of this. And then you get things like these synthetic plant based, um, you know, meat substitutes. You know, this is, is what bothers me because yeah. w the most important thing that we've ever spoken about when it comes to food is processed food, stay away from. So now let me go vegetarian or vegan for my health, but supplement my meat with, the most processed food. processed food ever created on the face of earth. I'd rather eat insects than eat a Beyond Burger because at least insects mm -hmm. are unadulterated. They're clean. There's no hormones. To make a plant-based burger, and I don't know if it's impossible or Beyond Burger, one of them, there's uh, something in there that's called heme protein, which is a byproduct of combining certain bacteria with yeast. But what's happening is they've found it contains 80% 80 more estrogen in this concoction than even the most um, hormone-filled, you know, lot-fed beef. So, you know, you're going, something's going to go wrong. Yeah, there was a time when smoking was thought of as okay. There was a time when um, aspartame and saccharine was thought of as okay. And now we're going back and we haven't learned our lesson. These lab created meats are, something's not right. It's not what, I just think it goes against the grain on every level. And we're going to learn the hard way. We're going to come up with a new classification of different kinds of cancers and diseases. And nobody's going to say anything because nobody wants to be liable. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a disaster waiting to happen. It's so interesting. I interviewed a, a, the most amazing woman. She went um, raw for about four months. It was really interesting. And then she, now she eats vegetarian. Mostly. Yeah. She doesn't eat vegan, but lots of nuts. And she's a bit of a grazer, really. That's how she does her food. And I was like, oh, you know, you must have lots of wonderful recipes. She's like, oh, no, and I've eaten cooked all. I just jar whatever comes my way. <laughs> But she also is not eating processed food, and she swears by it. She just says that my body feels light, I'm strong, I have energy, I'm healthy. I've never experienced that anymore. But she also doesn't do um, raw anymore because the raw was partly, mm -hmm. I think it was 
too extreme, too hard. And partly, but she said that going on the raw for the four months set her up really well. Yeah. To take care of the way that she now eats. And she swears so, by it. She says she would never do anything. But so I've interviewed her. She's like, you've got to go vegetarian at the very least. It's really amazing. Um, other people are like, damn that, I need my protein. I need my meat protein. And I must admit, I, I'm not a vegetarian. I do eat a lot of vegetarian meals, mm -hmm. a lot of vegetarian food. But I have recently reintroduced more protein into my diet because I do find that I have more energy when I eat protein. And I'm yeah. pretty sure that's the reason. So it's, it's, true. Like, it's a very difficult to know exactly what to do. You know, this one's saying vegetarian, this one's saying vegan, this one's saying you've got to go raw, this one's saying like, oh my God, do you know what I mean? I eat the meat, you eat yourself. the meat. Like, mm. it's, yeah. I guess every individual, because if you're saying that the mind is so important, which we both agree on, then that's a big aspect of your energy too, right? Very much so. Very, very much so. So just to backtrack, I was vegetarian for about six years, years ago. And then yeah. I went vegan for about two years. And I th mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's what, because that triggered uh, in me an autoimmune issue. Uh, oh, really? so my, my thyroid stopped working um, and I developed celiacs. And I can Why put do that you think that triggered to... autoimmune? What, for what reason? Uh, no B12, no um, iron, oh, everything okay. just We're fell apart. Amino acids are the building blocks of every organ and tissue in your body. Um, my digestive ability to digest anything completely diminished. I could actually feel it falling apart. And I didn't really think, I didn't want to believe it was the food. I thought it was something else. I thought it was somebody's, mm -hmm. some doctor's fault because they didn't figure it out. It was, it was, and I know that it was that because one day I was at a friend's bri and there was raw force and I ate it. And I felt <laughs> so good. I was like, oh, give me this stuff. And <laughs> not even bolt on, just raw, raw mints, and the 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 like. The light switched on. It's like my brain came back, my energy came back, my mood wow. came back within minutes. I was like, oh goodness, I've been slowly killing myself with you know vegetarian. I can understand, no problem with that. You can still get in a wide spectrum of, of your aminos and your proteins. Yeah. But I mean, I've done raw veganism, and your gut is not designed to break down hard fiber all the time it can cause big problems um, and there are many many vegetables that cannot you cannot release the nutrients out of them while they're raw mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know if you had to go and pick a chickpea in in a field which you know you wouldn't do that uh, you'd probably end up with the most incredible diarrhea because your body can't break down those 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 fibers um you know, carrots and tomatoes you don't get the beta carotene or the lycopene out of those vegetables unless you cook them they need those cells need to be released they need to be softened and broken open and you can only do that with heat no matter how much you chew you can't get the beta carotene out of the carrots it'll go through your system intact so there's this fine points to understanding what this is all about you know Everybody's on this thing about, oh, this is how nature intended. If nature intended, got its way, you'd be dead at 46. It really, it would have done you through by now. You'd have to hunt for everything you eat. You couldn't digest the half of it, and a, and a bug would take you out. So, you yeah. know, if you want to live long and well and healthy, you've got to understand how these things work. Then make a decision. I think plants should be central to our our diet. I think mm -hmm. don't, nobody eats nearly enough plant matter. Mm -hmm. um, it should be a part and parcel of every meal. So yes, it's seriously lacking, but not to the detriment of every other nutrients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now I have an interesting question for you because this has always been on my mind. I've always been like, hmm, this is curious, you know. We're always talking about getting variety. Right, having a now that makes perfect sense to me because yellow vegetables have different components to red vegetables have different components to green vegetables have different components to meat, blah, 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 variety, variety, variety. And then I go, okay, cool. But then I look at the show and we're in the Amazon rainforest and we're looking at this tribe and what do they eat all day, every day, unless they're lucky enough to catch a monkey, manioc. The starchiest, starchiest inside of a tree known to man. It looks disgusting. I don't know how they managed to survive on. I'd rather just shoot myself in. <laughs> they eat manioc every day. But that's what they live on. They're in this rainforest, you'd think that there'd actually be a lot of variety in a rainforest, but they eat manioc. And they mm. all seem perfectly okay. They've got their teeth in. 
they look perfectly healthy, the old people are old, the young people are young, you know, they're not dying left and right from cancer. Mm. Somebody said to me, maybe actually we should have less variety. Maybe we should be having, you know, when the restaurants, they all talk about you know, the local foods, what is produced locally, what is in season. That makes a lot of sense to me to be eating what is produced locally and in season, not just from an environmental aspect of somebody flew that across and used how many tons of jet fuel to get it here. But in terms of my biome has been raised on that stuff. It must be capable of digesting that stuff and making use of that stuff. What is your thought on that? Yeah, and no, I think you're absolutely right. It'll be very interesting to see what's in that, that plant that they eat and how much it could be high in amino acids, it could be high in fats as well. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a, there's a toss up between getting a lot of variety and eating what's seasonal. Um, not everybody can handle all foods, you know. Yeah. Um, so you, yeah, I think maybe less choice, but m more more mindset around why I'm making choices to eat certain things um, isn't a bad idea, you know. Uh, yeah, that makes all kinds of sense. And yeah, you look at people in the rainforest; they don't have the kind of stress levels we have either. Their lives well, are pretty straightforward. Yeah. Their their stress is survival. Uh, yeah. That's what the human brain is designed to deal with. Uh, yeah. They probably eat a lot of bugs in and amongst yeah. everything else they're eating. So they're probably getting a lot of a bug protein, which is a really good form of protein. I think that's the next wave of, of protein powders we're going to see is locust protein powder and things like that. Those because it's super nasty, clean. Squishy, yeah. Worms with a little black head or brown head. Yeah. Or so as long as it's made into a powder and doesn't look like a bug most people won't even know the difference the thing is you're not going to end up with allergens in there and hormones and it's just bug powder probably much better for you than anything else not going to cause any weirdness so the new yeah. wave nikki robinson's bug powder formula i think i want to look into that mapani you worm protein mm. you're going to corner the market in bug powders <laughs> yeah yeah, it's such a it's such a, a insane industry to be in, but it's it's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in food, and I've always found it both incredibly fascinating because I think it's so important, and because I subscribe to taking care of myself and my own health and my own diet and my own body, and I want that kind of energy and I want that kind of yes. vitality. So I've always I've always been very fascinated and done a lot of study about it, but I've also found it very very irritating. Because yeah. no sooner is ever amazing for you than ever is the, the greatest sin that's got too much fat. And then, whoa, ever made a comeback. Ever's like a superfood. Okay, cool. We're good. Now, no sooner than it's just like, oh, geez, you know, where do yeah. we go with that? Because they're just, yeah. the new information just keeps on coming. And, the, and it just says, oh, by the way, carbohydrates used to carbo load before a sport event. Don't ever carbo load again. In fact, take carbohydrates out of your diet completely. It's like, whoa, take carbohydrates. Okay, wait, no, you can't take all the carbohydrates out of your diet. It's like half your food comes from that. Okay, wait, where are we now? <laughs> what is the latest idea? It is tricky. That's the, that's the, that's the problem. Yeah, it, it is. It's just, it's, it's a minefield. And no wonder people are confused. No wonder all of us are trying all these different things. Yeah, it's just, you've got to get, get our head screwed back on. Right. So one you've got to pay attention to yourself. Two, it's useful to have somebody who knows more than you do, go and see them. And three, what I like is that with visiting somebody like you, you have the additional capacity of doing a blood test, checking that thyroid, checking what's going on in the digestive, um, mm. checking what's going on in terms of sensitivities and what maybe is not working for your body at all. Mm. And working with somebody who can help your mind, because for me, that is so key. Like, where yes. is my head? Where is my head in this moment? If my head is in happiness, actually my body can probably do well even with something that's marginally toxic, yes. you know? But yes. um, if it's not, even the merest little thing is going to set me Exactly. That's right. Mm. Okay. What are your lessons for today? I did Question my everything. Question, Question everything. everything. Don't take anything at face value. If it doesn't feel right, ask. And if somebody can't give you an answer, then they're not the person for you. Hmm. Good advice. Mm. I like it. Mm. Well, let's call it a time out. We've been on chatting away and having a wonderful time for an hour. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a sweet Thank pleasure you. getting to know you and sneaking into your mind a little bit and finding out all these things. 
This has been great. It's lovely to get it all out. An hour is really cool. So it's it's like there's so much we can go and talk yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we can talk forever. Wait, before you go, I just want to pop that at the bottom. So this is Nikki's... Um, email address and my email address for those people who would like to talk to us about any of the things that we do. Um, I have available many, many videos available on YouTube, on my channel. I've got lots of stuff available on my website that is absolutely free. You can come and access and really help yourself. I do a discovery session for those people who are looking to do a program with me to help themselves find that sense of self-love, self-worth unconditionality that they can just really feel good about themselves so feel free to call me about that kind of thing um nikki has wonderful programs also she's got a variety to choose from you're welcome to get hold of her if you're looking to look to your health to your physicality to your weight to just looking how can you help yourself and set yourself on a course that really helps you physically and obviously when helping yourself physically emotionally as well um she also has a podcast tell us briefly about that next Oh, that, that started in COVID this year. It's up to 31 episodes now, so that's buzzing along. It's all mm -hmm. health stuff and really interesting people. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. But you can get um, – it's on all the podcast, podcast platforms, um, Apple, Google, or you name it. It's out there okay. in abundance. So, so it's quite lots fun. of free stuff from Nikki, lots of free stuff from me. Also, you'll find us both on Real Health. We both do some stuff on the Real Health, channel, on the Real Health Show on DSTV. And um, I'm also on W24. And Nikki, I think you also do some stuff on 702. Yeah, quite a lot on 702. Um, yeah, those are pretty much our platforms. Yeah. So keep your peepers open for us on these platforms. And if you need anything, just feel free to get hold of us. We're very available to you. Awesome. Have a wonderful Thanks day, so everybody. Enjoy. Thanks, hey.